Very much. So back to, to the Surah Al-Baqarah, and uh, if you recall uh, last uh, session, we started really discussing the passage about, uh, about Al-Hajj. And uh, again, I want you to see Al-Hajj as really the, the most efficient uh, mechanism by which you can put large number of people like in a crucible, put them together. How they, how you, you are really putting them in an environment so that they can learn, okay, how to deal with each other when, as they are representing humanity in terms of their, the color of their skin, their ethnicity, their uh, 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 language, okay? So you are really bringing all these people in one place and really we, ha we have not really asked that question. How come you have this huge number of people year after year and really we don't hear about major issues among the people? <laughs> Be because Again, I mean, these, these are really very effective mechanisms, if you like, or tools, okay, so, so that we can learn, okay, uh, especially at a time when people have difficulty connecting with, e with, with each other because they are dispersed over huge, I mean, geographical areas, and at the same time, the modes of communication were not really uh, advanced at, at that time. So imagine you have an opportunity, a, a, a conference, a, uh, uh, um, where people can really come and interact with, with each other and discuss their issues, uh, uh, however they, educational, okay? Uh, even we will see that even Quran said even there may be a, 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 a chance for, for trade there's nothing wrong about that because this is part of life and uh, 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 Quran wants us to see the balance to see how our dimensions okay different dimensions can be realized okay in in a setting really like that, okay? So Quran is saying, Al-Hajju Ashhurun Ma'lumat. Probably in the reference like that, we know that Al-Hajj takes place in a few days during the month of Al-Hijjah, okay? But the, probably the preparation starts earlier, probably after Ramadan and, and Eid Al-Futr, so people start really preparing. So it is a season. Okay, uh, that uh, where people start feeling the, the effect and the need to prepare for that really, really journey. Or could it could be that uh, uh, every year there is this month, so over the years they become many months. Ashurun <laughs> Ma'luma, they are very uh, well known times. And here comes really the issue of the consciousness of time and the space. And, and we have seen it like in, in our prayer, how we become more conscious of time and the space because the prayer is it intimately associated with time. Okay, we have salah for, for uh, zuhr, for asr, for maghrib, different times. So we became more conscious of the concept of time. The same thing in, in Al-Hajj, and the, the term is very beautiful, because we say Miqat, you know, the place where we all start Al-Hajj, is called Miqat. It is, although it is a place, but the word Miqat, if you look at it in Quran, it also means time, from Waqat. <laughs> so, time and the space come together as Becoming one dimension. Now today in physics, is that right? Now they, uh, time and the space are looked at as one 
dimension. So the word miqat is very beautiful because embedded in it the, the uh, concept of time as well as being also referring to, to space. In يَوْمَ الْفَصْلِ كَانَ مِيقَاتًا So it is a time. Okay. So, فَمَنْ فَرَضَ فِيهِنَّ الْحَجِّ Now when we say fard, what comes to mind? That it is an obligation. Is that right? But some, the obligation coming from a higher authority. Is that right? Here comes Brother Noor. This is another interesting thing. Although, who, who will make something obligatory on us? Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Or, or, or through his prophet, peace be upon him, okay, that will make something obligatory. But here, you are making this obligatory on yourself. You see, فَمَنْ فَرَضَ فِيهِنَّ الْحَجِّ You become the one who will accept that, that obligation. And so it reflects this, this autonomy, which means that you are doing it out of love. You are making it obligatory on yourself. Taking the ownership. Okay. Taking the ownership. Very good. You see the, so the, you are empowering the human being. It reminds me of Ayat 177, where so, Atal Mali, Allah, 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 Okay, so you put your effort and time and uh, 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 everything you, you, you have in order to achieve really something. And this is not an easy journey. Okay, so unless it comes from inside you, okay, it will be very difficult to, to follow, okay, and, or to achieve really that very important uh, journey. Because, again, it's not meant for itself, but what it really represents, or what are really the things that we need to learn from that experience. It's, it's not just movements, okay? But as we said last time, that Al-Hajj becomes like a blueprint that will tell us how we should lead our own life. So it is like a simulation of what your life should look like. The unfortunate thing is that we start to look at these experiences as like idiosyncratic, as if they are really a special situation, instead of looking at them as the model to, to model our own life outside or after that experience. You see the, where is the disconnect today? That I'm, I'm living my life and then I will go to Al-Hajj as, as like disconnected from what I do on daily basis. Instead of saying how that experience will help me to live my life. And the, the common question that I'm sure many of you have heard before, at what age should I do my Hajj? my pilgrimage okay now the answer becomes easier okay if we really understand if we understand or we view al-hajj as a mean as a method to learn about how i should lead my life when should i go early or late the earlier the, part, the, 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 the better because i want to know how my life should look from that experience. But again, if that view is not there, oh, I will, I, let me postpone it until I am really um, at old age and I have nothing else to do and then, it, so it has nothing to do then with my life. But that is not the intention of all these modes of worship. They are meant, again, to the, back to the question, who need them? 
and really from the days of Ibrahim alayhi salam, who basically started that experience. When he built Mecca, uh, uh, Kaaba in, in Mecca, and he, he, it was referred to as the first house built for the people. إن أول بيت وضع للناس للذي ببكة. Now it's like think of your own house. Is it a house or you want it to be a home, Sister Nancy? Home. Is that right? What does that really? What does it mean to you to make your house a home? For whoever comes to, you see so the whole idea of al-bayt is how you can bring these people make them safe uh, in an environment where they can interact with each other at the highest level of uh, warmth and caring okay so they can learn from that experience when they come back to their own houses and their own homes. Okay? And this is why this masjid, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala call it bait. So it, so it has, and really in, in our uh, own experience, we start to call it jama', which means the place where people are gathered and united. You see, because the concept, the vision is there. So you can, how you, your, your language will start to generate a new words, but they will be compatible in tandem with the vision. So if that is the vision, that this is house, although it is the house of Allah, but it is at the same time the house for the people. So how these people, how you can maintain the, this level of interaction to be at this higher caliber. فَلَا رَفَثَ وَلَا فُسُوقَ وَلَا جِدَالَ فِي الْحَجْ How you can bring the habits, the new habits. During that time, don't use these words that will affect your relationship with your fellow human being beside you. La rafa. Don't even, I mean, the prof, uh, uh, profanity will be an extreme. But Quran is saying, avoid any word <laughs> coming from your mouth, okay, that will really affect the feelings of the people around you. وَلَا فُسُوقَ فُسُوق is an, a Quranic idiom. It's a concept. How, how we can understand it the best. As we said earlier, search for it in Quran. I will refer you to the beginning of the surah, Surah Al-Baqarah. Just like to see, it's a good example where we can apply how it that concept moves within the different constructs of, of Quran. Verse number 26. Noor, do you see it? Yeah, I'm almost there. Yeah. 26. Higher number. 26 from Surah Al-Baqarah. That's how it starts? No, 26. Oh, okay. Here, okay, there's a different list. That's how in this... Uh, yeah, yeah. At the end of that one, وَمَا يُضِلُّ بِهِ وَمَا يُضِلُّ بِهِ كَثِيرًا بِهِ Yeah, وَمَا يُضِلُّ بِهِ فَاسِقِينَ Now, see the definition of Al-Fasiqeen in the following verse. Say it. Al-Ladina. So these are the people, the first attribute of Al-Fasiqeen. They, they start really like uh, cut, uh, um, uh, cutting their promises. They don't keep their promises or their covenants. 
or they, they don't respect their contracts with, with others. Next. وَيَقْطَعُونَ أَنْ يُوصَلَ So everything that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala asks us to, to, to unite, they disrupt. Okay, so people should come together, uh, the brothers and sisters, and they try to disrupt that fabric. And وَيُفْسِدُونَ فِي الْأَرْضِ So they spread mischief. So, so, so what is the common denominator? The disruption. The disruption yeah. However, they disrupt relationship with each other, with people among each other, or disrupt covenants and, and contracts, or they do mischief to anything in their environment. Instead of looking at these things as their yeah. friends, they start really like, like to today what we, what we do to the environment. So Quran is saying, okay, wala fusuqa. <laughs> Be careful about anything that may disrupt. Which goes against unity. Unity. Because all these people are coming to feel the caring and the tenderness and the love and, and, and the unity. Be careful about anything, even if it is a simple argument. <laughs> like especially when you are doing transactions, we start really arguing about the prices. Is that right? Even Quran is saying in that environment, even avoid that. To build that habit of how you become conscious of the importance and the value of the human being next to you. I mean, again, here, I, 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 it, it, it may sound so ironic because of what we are really seeing today. Everything is against that spirit. Everything we are seeing and hearing about in the media goes against that. So that is the counter argument that we have to support and we have to empower. Not only by talking, but by actions. So, لا فسوق ولا جدال ولا فلا رفث ولا فسوق ولا جدال في الحج. Because you, your aim or the aim of that exercise of how the people will feel that they are all in one and one in all. <laughs> Cohesiveness, solidarity. Okay. Uh, where the and again these are not easy uh, uh, goals or objectives in order for this to become part of the culture you start with habits this is the why, why the, 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 uh, habits have this power when you do something over and over again it becomes ingrained Second nature. Now you can say that this has become part of the culture. D don't be afraid of the word culture. Because really it, it boils down to the, uh, to the totality of habits, institutions that you basically build in a certain community. Okay? Or the arts. Not only fine arts, every art. Art of medicine, the art of research, the art of nursing. The art, all these are arts. Banking, uh, uh, all, all the, uh, commerce, uh, uh, agriculture, all these are arts. Sana'a. So again, all these should really, when they become established, then you can say, okay, I have created the culture of something, like the culture of unity. You see, it's not just a word that you say it. I'll give you another example. At my institution, they wanted like to create the culture of interprofessional practice and education. How are you going to achieve it? You have to start building habits that if I am a, like a, a, a medical doctor, I have no problem learning from a nurse 
or from a, somebody from physical therapy or another from a physician, a physician assistant. Or, you see, an interprofessional practice and education starts with building these habits. And then the whole university was built in a way so that within, inside, you can go from one department to another, from one school to another. You don't have to go outside. <laughs> Even the institution was built in that fashion to help people to see what does it really mean. After 10 years, they were able to say, we have created the culture of interprofessional practice and education. The same thing, if we want the culture of balance and equilibrium, we have to th start thinking, what are the habits that I have to build in the individuals and, and the groups? What type of institutions I need? What type of arts I need? So, take these modes of worship as they are bent for us. I was saying that Ibrahim alayhi salam, when he started that experience, inaugurated that experience, what did he say? وَأَرِنَا مَنَاسِكَنَا But what does it mean? Manasik rituals. But Ibrahim salam, is asking Allah to show him our rituals, not his rituals. He doesn't need them. I need them. I need these mechanisms to build these habits, to build that culture. Are you with me? Arina manasikana, not manasikaka. Not your rituals. Show us our ritual. These are for us, not meant for you. Because he doesn't need them, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We need them in order to make our life better. But again, things can be in your hands. But if you don't really make use of them, they are useless. Is that right? This is what is happening today. The, this disconnect that these things are available. We have the tools. We have the skills. But we are not making use of them. People go to Hajj and come back. I'm not denying the individual, I mean, uh, or the, um, the spiritual impact. And every time you talk to anybody coming from there, he or she can tell you about that beautiful experience. And really you will not know it un until you go there and experience it yourself. But I am talking about what is the impact on us as a community, as a society. What have we learned from that experience? Just, just a quick uh, remark yes. about what you just said about uh, Ibrahim al Islam Doha, you know. Uh, I'm just wondering, you know, that he, he was able to uh, articulate uh, his Doha. You know? I mean, I have a lot of things in my mind, but I cannot uh, articulate it. But the way beautifully, I mean, he did it. And now that we are so many hundred years later, mm -hmm. I really think that he was a very wise man. No question about it. I mean, uh, this is why Quran called him Wadi al Milla. He was, he basically, uh, if I may use that, that term, he was the architect of the message. If, because even the way he traveled, he was as if like telling us how he can see the journey of a prophecy going to be. Just look at the fact that he came from Iraq, went to Palestine, went to Mecca, went to Egypt, where the other prophets, the major prophets and messengers appear. Musa alayhi salam in Egypt. <laughs> Isa alayhi salam in Palestine and Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam in, in Mecca. So he was able to see, this is why I'm calling him the architect, putting the blueprint 
of the journey of a prophecy. It's very beautiful. And this is why Muhammad Sallallahu was asked to follow to the footsteps of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Millata Ibrahim. Which means that Milla is like from dictating. Okay, I, I ask you to write something and I start re like dictation. Okay, I say something and you write it down. So Al Milla is like he was able like to spell out the vision. That does not mean that Muhammad Sallallahu is repeating Ibrahim. He cannot repeat the experience of Ibrahim because they, they belong to different eras. This is why we, we saw it in Surah Al-Baqarah. Tilka ummatun qad khala. This, the, these people are gone. They belong to a different era. Their era has expired. Don't repeat it. But do not detach yourself from them. You see? So the, I like the idea of the paradigm. When you bring a new paradigm, does not mean I have to crush the previous one. No, I have to bring it to a higher level of understanding. In other words, the, the, you, you, you keep most of the components of the previous paradigm. But you order them now in a different way. In order to respond to new challenges. And humanity has, has re, uh, came to that, to that uh, understanding. And those of you who work in, in computers, they know it. Now as they are applying a new language in computers, they are searching for another one. Why? Because they know that the current one, at one point, it will, not, it will fail to respond to new challenges. It reaches like a plateau. <laughs> it will work, 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 and then oh, it, as if it like almost expired. <laughs> you need something. In the past, they, they were used to realize it as they reached the plateau. Now they become preemptive because they, they, they have seen it. One time after another, so they, they believe in it, that we need always to keep thinking about new paradigms, new languages. The same way we have to approach our Qur'an. Searching for a new reading that will enable us to respond to current challenges. I should not repeat the experience of those people. I build on that. And how can I liberate myself from the one before me? What is the best way to liberate yourself from a previous paradigm? To understand it. And I can assure you, when you move to a new paradigm, you will have better understanding than the people who brought the previous paradigm. Einstein be, and understood the physics of Newton more than Newton himself. Why? Because he, he, he was in a different time. He has accumulated more data. <laughs> so he was able to understand it better and transcend it, liberating himself from it. Not destroying it, because it still works. Your car, Newton is enough for it. Because the level of, uh, of the degree of the error is very small. But you cannot apply Newton to the subatomic realm. It fails. You need a bigger paradigm. This is the contribution of Einstein. And this is what I want you to see every time you see new innovation. Where the, the paradigm shifted. <coughs> Somebody like Sister Fatima will be the most capable. Honestly. Because you see all the time in new innovations. You are part of the new innovation. But I want you to see where, where the change happened. Where was the shift? 
And I think, before I say I believe, at least at this level I can see, say, I think that when we see shift in the paradigm, then we can say that this is really a new innovation. That becomes the test. Is this really represents a progress or not? Because every time people come bring something new, but does it really, this new thing represents an innovation, something that's transcended the previous one or giving better? <coughs> and I will share with you very interesting thing. One of the measures, one of the measures today, today, to say that a new innovation represents progress that is better than the one before it if, it if we can show that it is beneficial to the people. <laughs> and believe me, my dear brothers and sisters, this is the rigor that I was talking about. When Quran uh, uh, defines the truth this way, وَأَمَّا مَا يَنْفَعُ النَّاسَ فَيَمْكُثُ فِي الْأَرْضِ Whatever benefits the people will stay. It will not be withdrawn. <laughs> it's like when the FDA approves a drug. Okay? If it works, it will stay in the market. But if it starts showing death and, and, and significant side effects, what do we say? The drug is withdrawn from the market. Why? Because it did not benefit the majority of the people. So we were, so in other words, the people voted. The people at the end voted for the medication, not the FDA. <laughs> the FDA is a small group voting on that drug. Is that right? Based on the information that they had. Once they, there is more information and more practice, is that more use of the drug than the people now is voting whether this is a new innovation or not. Otherwise it will be withdrawn. If it is not, if it is false, Quran says, It will go away. It will not stay. Like this, like uh, bubbles that you see on the surface of a flowing water. Yeah. Does it stay? Then mean nothing. This is falsehood. It will go away. Beautiful. Right. Okay? Beautiful. Why? Because I have something to support. Okay? The revelation is telling me that this is the best way to know if something is right or wrong. See if it is going to help the people or not. You see what, what I told you last time, the concept of the people is the daily you can see it best in the practice of Al Hajj. Because there is no no verse talking about Al Hajj but to mention the people. Not Muslims or Mu'min or whatever. No qualify, qualification. And that's and you will see it now. So Quran says, وَمَا تَفْعَلُوا مِنْ خَيْرٍ يَعْلَمْهُ اللَّهِ Everything you do, good, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will know about it. So go ahead and do it. وَتَزَوَّدُوا So you are preparing yourself for the journey. Is that right? Usually we like, I mean we have something to sustain ourselves for that journey. But Quran has said what is really more important is taqwa. Which is what? In this context, what does it really mean, taqwa? It means this internal policing, because you owned that journey. You decided to go on that journey. So we also want you to be very conscious of your own behavior and your own action. We don't need policing. Imagine, you, do you have police to, to restrain three million people today? What is really restraining the people? The restraint is coming from inside. <clears throat> it's 
the restraint is coming from inside internal policing not external one al wazi'u lahu min nafsihi wattaquni ya uli al albab so those who have really clear minds will know what is this these are the people who are conscious of Allah meaning conscious of their name of his names because this is they want to realize his names in their own actions he, they believe in Allah as ghafoor so they practice maghfirat and forgiveness for the people around them imagine people don't forgive each other and, and during hajj what will happen you are practicing maghfira all the time because there are a lot of uh, possibilities for the mistake for the error you have to you are surrounded by millions of people the chances are very high unless you forgive unless you treat the people around you with mercy with kindness lutuf compassion rafa you How, how are you going to keep <laughs> the people together? They start fighting. Have you seen fights during Al-Hajj? Almost impossible. But, but why people don't... Why we don't look at this as possibility? لَيْسَ عَلَيْكُمْ جُنَاحٌ أَن تَبْتَغُوا فَضْلًا مِنْ رَبِّكُمْ During Al-Hajj, you can do other things, like a trade. People can, I mean, and this is an opportunity for people to exchange their products. Okay? And again, because as we always say that this is the balance that we have always to seek in our life. How the, the uh, materialistic, if you like, dimensions are really balanced with our spiritual. The, 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 the balance is not by bouncing. At one point I do this and another one, this is, this is not balance. This is oscillating. Bouncing between two extremes. It's not really the idea. The idea how these dimensions are really uh, like uh, realized at the same time. But keeping you, your core, yourself at equal distance from all these dimensions. فَإِذَا أَفَضْتُمْ مِنْ عَرَفَاتِ فَاذْكُرُوا اللَّهَ عِنْدَ الْمَشْعَرِ الْحَرَامِ As you know, at the end of the day and almost at sunset, okay, people will come down like in a surge from عرفات and they go to Muzdalifah. Or Al-Mash'ar Al-Haram. So like a... And this is my personal experience. I don't know what happened to me when, when we went to Muzdalifah. The, the most level of tranquility I have felt in all my life. Ask me how, why, I don't know. But it is amazing, I mean, that, that experience. Although there were a lot of people and, and uh, I mean, again, spending the whole day in, in Arafah and coming to that place is not uneasy. But I don't know. I mean, it's, it's uh, uh, I, uh, the only thing I can tell you that it is really even a feeling of euphoria and happiness. Again, I mean, the, this is a personal subjective thing and I am sure that people have experienced something similar or even better in, in that place or in, in other places. But that's, that's basically what you, you go through. وَاذْكُرُوهُ كَمَا هَدَاكُمْ وَإِن كُنْتُمْ مِنْ قَبْلِهِ لَمِنَ الضَّالِّينَ So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is, is always uh, re reminding us that if we do not Take his guidance, we will go astray. 
So in, in other words, he is the source of guidance. And we need to seek it from him. How you seek it? When, when you say, I, I am remembering Allah, it means that you are remembering all his names. And you are reminding yourself how I can, asking yourself, how can I realize these names in my own life? I have to experience them. Believe me, you will not mean, understand what uh, it means that Allah is the all-forgiving unless you experience that maghfirah. And again, in, in Al-Hajj, there is a huge opportunity to exchange experiences, even at that level. <coughs> So when you see somebody practicing maghfirah during that difficult I mean time okay so you you learn from that experience when you see another one practicing mercy when you see another one practicing generosity when you see another one practicing caring okay you see well so the exchange is not only at the level of ideas or at the level of of merchandise, trade, but I would say also we need, because the, 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 the remembrance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is key here. But what does that really mean? Just lip service saying, oh, yeah, oh, yeah Allah, you are al Ghafur, you are Al-Rahim, you are, or you are saying, how can I realize, because I need these values these virtues in my own life. It seems like, you know, if I'm, uh, uh, just uh, yes. before the Hajj, you know, it would be really uh, very nice, you know, if there was like a primer, you know, mm -hmm. like a uh, prerequisite, you know, like you go through a, a preliminary training you know, yes. to, to realize the full benefits. Yes, yes, you are right. Uh, otherwise you just go as, a, it's like a, it becomes like a, Mechanical, you know? yes, yes, or just a ritual. You know? To be honest with you, I have been saying this over the years, and and I think we, I mean, we have been working on this for the last at least 15 years, honestly. Mm -hmm. And I, I personally, I, I feel that we are capable also as a group, yeah, to, to present or to put like a small curriculum. Okay, where people can really have this, and today with, with uh, the different ways how you can present it, the audiovisual, you can show a movie, you can, you can make it into a short movie, you can uh, do it as a prezi presentation, uh, more than just a PowerPoint. I mean, with pictures and everything, because everything is imaginary before you go. But if you, give also the, the feeling of the place and the, 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 the people and also the meaning. That what becomes really the most important. So that when they go, they bring these meanings, okay, to, to, their, to their consciousness, okay. And, and then they will see, oh, okay, I am really learning something from that really experience, from this really journey. And I, honestly, when, when myself, when I went to Al Hajj, um, and like uh, after a uh, couple years, I, uh, I attended a conference um, related to, 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 to my uh, profession. But it was really more about the physician-patient relationship, that concept was uh, at that time, I mean, uh, uh, more research has been done on this and so we went to that conference to learn more about that. But the way they conducted the conference, and I'm not sure if any one of you has gone through a similar thing, it's, it was really not a like the regular convention that you attend where it's, it's really like a, uh, um, like a picnic. I mean, you go and uh, to attend a lecture, sometimes you may leave 
<laughs> from, before it, it ends, whatever. I mean, you are, you are. That, that was a, a different type of, of, of conference where they put you under a lot of pressure. It was very interactive. They expect from you to answer questions. You have to, to write something down, to, to ask uh, uh, yourself questions, to, to interact with the people around you. I mean, at the end of the day, you feel like, <laughs> I mean, you are, I, mean, I remember my, my fellow calling me uh, to tell me about the patients, and she said, I'm sure you are having good time. I said, not really. <laughs> 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 because this is the idea I mean, when you go to a, you, you, it's like a vacation okay? but that conference was really very stressful to the point that at the end of it you find yourself sharing things with, with, with strangers <laughs> very private that was meant yes. by that, that conference okay? but what happened after like this long day okay, of, of uh, 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 like pressure they take you to dinner or to at, uh, to see a play or something like that and then uh, things will be uh... so th that uh, when I attended that conference then I remembered the experience I, I could understand the experience in Al Hajj because it is very stressful okay and then at the end of the day you you have like a dinner or something like that and you relax and, and then the next day you go through another stressful thing and then there will be time when you relax and every, so but I, I think the, um, the it, it seems that the reason they did it this way because they felt that we learn under some level of stress they have to balance it even the, the people who were, I mean, arranged that conference, they were very conscious of that, that they, they will put us under certain level of stress so that it will be commensurate with our capabilities so that we can learn the most of, of that experience. Because if, it, the, if the stress is too much, <coughs> we, we, you will not really get anything. So you... Uh, you, you see what I mean? So it, it has to be to a certain level yeah. where it will be beneficial, right. okay? You get the, 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 the maximum of that experience, okay? Then you relax and then you go through. You, and, and really the four or five days, you can see it in this way. And here comes really, I would say, the, the, the crux of the, the, um, uh, the, the subject, which is uh, w that we stressed over and over before, is the importance of the concept of the people. And read with me. You know, the people are coming down from Arafat. Is that right? And you are talking about huge numbers. Okay? So you have to be really ex experiencing and uh, practicing all these uh, high values in order to keep things really at bay, okay? But there is, was another co important uh, concept here. Before Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, before the message of Islam, that has been practiced. But what they used to do, people who, the elite, will have a different path than the ordinary people. The commoners. The commoners. <laughs> so, you see, this is the new paradigm. This is the shift. Again, the components are the same. Arafah and Muzdalifa and the coming down. It was a practice before. But Quran is saying, Afidu man haythu afad nas Come down in this surge with the people. Not... Segregate. segregate yourself or distinguish yourself from, from the people. So the idea of al-mala or elite versus the people or the masses, okay, should be abolished. And you will not see that more emphasized than al-hajj. Yes, brother, doctor. Is it really practiced nowadays? Malaks have the difference. 
it is uh, in a subtle, probably in subtle ways. Yes, it is unfortunately. But you can see, imagine, imagine the uh, let us say the um, the royal family, let us say, who uh, may be there or certain members of them coming down with the people. I mean, it's, I mean, it will be completely different impression that the people will feel. They really will feel the equality. They feel that these people care for them, respect them. I mean, all these meanings will be completely different. So, and, and really, during our history, it, it, it happened. Like sometime, one time, one of the Prophet's descendants, Zainul Abidin, was making Al-Hajj, and the, the, and you know, the, the, the house of the Prophet, okay, were really revolutionary people, honestly. They will not keep their mouth shut. They will not accept any unjust practices, even if they come from the Caliph himself or the, the, the leader of the, of the community at that time. And uh, Zain al-Abidin was approaching the black stone at the same time when the, the caliph was approaching. And the people, when they saw Zain al-Abidin, <laughs> Zain al-Abidin, I mean, like, like he was like a scholar, descendant from the prophet, and all, with all the, I mean, it's, it's not just the lineage, but really the caliber of that individual. You can see how the people opened the, the way for him. And they did not do that for the caliph. And they said, who is this guy? The caliph started asking, who is this guy? <laughs> you, you see what I mean? So, the, so in other words, the people should really appreciate you. They bring you to the forefront. Not you dictate that on them. Okay? So that, that, and to the point that a poet put it in, uh, I think, Al-Farazdaq, I, uh, uh, I think Al-Farazdaq, I'm sorry? No, 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 this is a long time ago. Uh, a contemporary poet put it in, in, in poetry. Okay? That, so uh, that, that, I mean, the people recognized immediately who really should be given the, the higher respect okay and he was no question was very humble person but the people elevated because of his knowledge and and uh, uh, the, the way he treated the people around him and because really the, the, what we uh, used to say about the prophet peace be upon him and how he treated especially the homeless where how he opened his own really place for these people. And that legacy continued. Continued in his descendants. So we are not saying that because they belong to the family of the Prophet, they are... No, 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 because they carried the legacy of the Prophet. Alayhi salatu wasalam. And that what really give, gave them uh, that status, if you like, even among people in terms of people loving them and respecting them. ثم أفيضوا من حيث أفاض الناس واستغفر الله. and really one will will ask why Allah سبحانه وتعالى is asking us to to ask him for forgiveness. usually what comes to mind in this context like if if we are committing something wrong. but there is nothing you are you are performing حج. You are not doing something wrong. Why we need the forgiveness? If you believe in Allah Ghafurun Rahim, then and you are asking for forgiveness, then practice forgiveness with the people around you. And now I, I can see it like where you need the forgiveness more to be practiced among people during this act. Any one of you who has been to, to Hajj, you know how you are talking about millions of people coming through, through a very narrow place. So if people do not exercise forgiveness, what will happen? 
stampede and pushing and, and people start, but nothing with that usually, I mean, all the time, I mean, uh, it will be done in a very peaceful way. You see, I, I mean, my point here is that sometimes you may be practicing something, but it is very important to bring it to the consciousness of the people. We have all the time thought about istighfar as always in the negative sense. Yes, you, ca you make istighfar when you commit something wrong. Is that right? But I want you to see the positive part of it all, also. Istighfar sometimes when you move from something good to do something better. This is also istighfar. This is tawbah. But in the positive sense, it's not only to mean to wipe out previous sins. No, no. To keep the movement. This is how we understand the istighfar of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he doesn't need istighfar in the negative sense. He needed to be elevated and to free himself all the time from whatever level he would reach. He, he said, فَلَا أَكُونُ عَبْدًا شَكُورًا Shukr is reflection of a freedom. Ibadatul Ahra. And Ta'bud Allah Shukran Fatilka Ibadatul Ahra. You you worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala out of gratitude. This is the worship of the free. You are not asking for that something. You are, not, you, you are beyond asking for his Jannah or to, to protect you from his hellfire. You see why these are two different levels. There is a higher level when you transcend even hellfire and paradise and you ask for his own, his pleasure, to be with him. You see, this is much higher out of a gratitude, not because you need something. Just because he deserves to be thanked. Out of his love. You see that this is you see that this is ever elevation. This is elevation and this is liberation. What does it really mean when I say thank you to you, Sister Fatima? I'm acknowledging that you helped me with something. This means that I am freeing myself from my ego that is always telling me, no, no, you don't need anybody. No, I need others. Autonomy does not mean self-sufficiency. The fact that you have to be autonomous in this life does not mean that you don't need the help of others. Otherwise, why Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created all these people around me? وَبَثَّ مِنْهُمَا رِجَالًا كَثِيرًا وَنِسَاءً is that right? Why Allah created all these men and women around me if I don't really feel the need for them? Yes. I think last time I think I brought this up too. Like again, the concept of this is for humankind. Exactly. I think we need to revisit the criteria of Hajj mm -hmm. to say that okay, if you are, you have a certain group of people, only Muslim interacting with each other. Where we can get the practice to practice, you know, apply that in, in, in the world. Exactly. Where there's not everybody is Muslim. Exactly. Where not everybody is the same, from the same country, same language. They don't have the same means of, for, of a living, right? How can you have that if we are continuing with this Hajj, the ritual, the way we're doing in, in the past? How do you see that? I, I, yeah. I don't see that. Yeah. And, and I, 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 I agree with you that this is really an, an, a very good opportunity. Again, uh, we are trying to see that this is a place or a, a, an experience where people can learn uh, about all these things. And the way I see it, that, you know, the, the, the pilgrimage of the Prophet happened very late. Short before he departed this life. So basically towards the end of his journey as, as a prophet and a messenger. Is that right? And you can see from the verses that were revealed towards the end 
of his journey, the, the one about ta'aruf, that people come, were created from ma- males and females and made into tribes and nations so that they know and be known by others, to know each other and to be known by others. How we can learn together, how we can learn from each other, how we can learn about each other. This is the whole idea in a, an environment of a mutual recognition. You recognize me as important in your life, I recognize you as important in my life. And in Hajj, you see the, the idea of tawaf, but you don't see it anywhere else. Do you make tawaf every day? We, know, we, know, we do it only when we go to Hajj. It's, why? Because and, and you do it around Al Kaaba, where you see multitude of directions, but one God, represented by Al Kaaba. So all these people are moving around. Imagine one is in this position and another one diametrically opposite around Al Kaaba. So for each, the, no one is the Qibla for the other. Both of them has a common Qibla. But then they move. And that person will stand in your place and you will be in his or her place. As if you are exchanging, you, you are putting yourself in the shoes of others as we say it today. So is there more than this to teach us about exchanging experiences? So does Al-Hajj, this is what we have to ask ourselves, is Al-Hajj helping us to see Ta'aruf as the objective of our trajectory in this life? Peace and Ta'aruf is really the goal of the trajectory. I think because Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam did it towards the end of it because he wanted, he knew that there's the humans after that, the people who need somewhere to get prepare to yourself. Prepare yourself. Because you will because, be, yes, you know, prepare say, yourself. Done, exactly. Done. No, if you are succeeding yeah. inside, you will succeed outside. It's the legacy. Yes. So if you practice it inside, your kids. Okay, if they practice well at home, you don't worry if you take them to a restaurant, they will behave in the same way. Or you take them to, to visit a friend. Believe me, no matter what, they will manifest it. If they are doing something wrong at home, they will manifest it in the park. So if you take care of them if at home, don't worry where you take them or where they go. To the park, to the street, to the school, they will behave in the same way. They reflect what they have learned at home. Same thing, Al-Hajj. Okay, if we take advantage of it and learn how we should deal with each other and and acquire these new habits, okay, in this place of simulation if you like in this lab of simulation you go outside and you apply the same thing but we need to to uh, a curriculum that right. you were talking about yeah. or a training session before al hajj you bring these issues to the consciousness of the people when you became conscious of something you do it better yes reminded me when you said that if we teach our kids at home, then we don't need to worry. Because uh, I was startled when I heard the president of MIT giving a talk when we brought Amina to leave her in her freshman year. They were telling us that uh, all these sex, uh, doing sex objects were left at the mercy of all these young people at the 18. And some of uh, some Indian fellow, somebody asked the president. I was just thinking, what kind of freedom does MIT provide, leaving the condom and uh, all these things, and even the um, for drugs, everything was free uh-huh. uh, and left in their um, bathroom. So this fellow 
uh, who was a professor an Indian professor attendant at the president uh, what kind of uh, freedom do you give to our children who are just 18 providing them with all and he said if you have trained your children well at home you don't need to worry if you have not done your job he said it very other country but to the point if you have not done it I better say you think twice before leaving here mm -hmm. so mashallah you know our children go there with such open environment I mean even the goose is yeah, 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 about yeah, the yeah, right. because right. with all these beautiful yes, yes. things at MIT they have all this freedom <coughs> in the back uh, and then they proclaim that so we yes, have to yes. train you're, you're our right. You are right. Well. You're and, right. Yes. and talking yeah. about coming They're, back to yeah. the hush, mm -hmm. I have never heard anyone bring it to life so beautifully as yeah. again I come back after six uh, weeks of teaching in Pakistan. Something maybe you better do this so that you give them. There are many, many lectures before you go, there are many models for Hajj, but nobody brings the way Dr. They emphasize really the ritualistic component of it, so but no really going deeper into the meanings right, right. that really associate. Yeah. Even the names, yeah. believe me, the names that are given are not haphazardly chosen. Yeah. Okay, and so we really, I mean, uh, again, there is a very strong relationship between responsibility and the freedom. Yeah. I mean, I'm sure you have ex experienced that with your own children. If you have a responsible child, you give them more yeah, freedom. Is that right? If you see that they are behaving irresponsibly, you start to shrink. They're, even you take away from them the keys of the car or something yeah. like that, if they, to, to, that, to that extent. Yeah. But really, if they, if you have a responsible child and ask you, I want to uh, bring uh, ice cream at 10.30 at night, you say, go. I mean, because you know that they are responsible. Yeah. So, the, the, our job, okay, is not really to act as someone who is looking over the shoulders yeah. of your kids. Yeah. <coughs> our job is really to share with them the, the values Absolutely. and to see them in the practice because this is what they if and, and I'm telling you our kids should see how we treat each other especially as men and women they have to see that because this is what they will internalize they may not be sitting in the same room with you but you know they, they are aware of everything happening around them. You see, they, they learn sometimes, okay, just by what is being, what is happening around them. Similar to the, the, the model of the prayer, okay? You are the leader in the prayer, but are you looking at the people behind you? In fact, they are looking at you. <laughs> If you make a mistake, they will correct you. But if anybody behind you makes a mistake, you will not be aware of it. You see, this is a very, uh, it's a very beautiful model. It's not the same funny. thing as parents, we should not be over the shoulder. Today they are with me, tomorrow they are not with me. Yeah. You see, yeah. well, for one reason or another. Yeah. But I will make sure that the values that you instilled in them will judge them. They will use them to judge their own actions. Even if they make mistakes, they know how to transcend them. Exactly. We are not going really to play that role. Our role is basically to provide a, an environment where they can see the importance of these values in their life. And that these, if they stick to these values, they will be successful, they will be happy, they will be beneficial yeah. to, to, to their own society. What do we need more than that? Yeah. <laughs> you see what I mean? It's not by force or dictating on them what they really need to do. And again, 
the, we, 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 uh, the, 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 there is an opportunity, honestly. Okay? How we can uh, transform these dear practices in our life, however it is the, the prayer, fasting, or al-hajj, okay? <clears throat> or even the zakat itself. Okay? How we can uh, transform them okay, into models that will that help us to see how should our social life really go? Yes. If you can maybe explain a little more um, this ayah, Nesa alaykum dunam and tattabu fadlam mir rabbi. Yeah. So how basically, yeah. The, yeah. For example, yeah, uh, it, it, it's really more than that. But uh, trade is one example. Okay. Because really, you, uh, you are, you remember like in Surah Al Jumu'ah. Okay, فَإِذَا قُدِيَةُ الصَّلَاةُ فَانْتَشِرُوا فِي الْأَرْضِ وَابْتَغُوا مِنْ فَضْلِ اللَّهِ Go back to your work and you see now it's, it's, not, it's more than transaction. It is really from, from the fadl of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So you gave like a direction to your own transactions. So during Al-Hajj, other things can be done. Okay, including trade, exchange of experiences, exchange of knowledge, exchange of, of um, this, is okay. this is part of it. So, so in other words, there are, these dimensions should not be suppressed, but to be equalized with what we call the spiritual components of it. You see what I mean? So how we can, because the, 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 the these practices are not really meant to withdraw you completely from life. But to make that balance between the ability to withdraw from, from the world, but also to be able to come back to the world. How you can equalize and balance these two forces. Okay, because we have the, these are dimensions in us. Okay, but the challenge is how you, you can satisfy these needs. Okay? So you feel it sometimes. You feel, okay, sometimes you, you work for so many hours and you say, I really just want like some time to, to withdraw a little bit. Okay? Do something different. Okay? For example, you go to, to prayer. Okay? So you, Quran is saying, uh, build that capacity to free yourself from whatever you are doing. Okay? And Al-Hajj is, is, is the biggest thing. You are t leaving your family, you are leaving your, your uh, 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 trade, your work, your shop. I mean, you are t t doing all these things. So you are liberating yourself from all these things. But don't stay all the time like this. <laughs> you have the ability to come back. But now... You are coming back with the new habits. You are coming back with giving a new direction to what you are really doing. That will become more meaningful. And to realize more or, or the, 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 these high values or the names of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala at a higher level. Speaking of which, you know... Uh there are instructions for these, uh, the Hajj and all that, yeah. but these are like uh, boilerplate instructions. You know? mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Well, what's needed, is, I, I think there's a tremendous opportunity to add the spiritual this flavor. Is what, this is what we know? need. That's what, yeah, yeah, the meaning. Okay, yeah. to, because the, the whole, or I think the, the, we can start changing the, what we call the epistemic question. Right. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Like the, the example that you started with, okay. uh, the, the, the khutbah of, of, of Dr. Asi. So he was trying like to, to change the, the epistemic question. Okay? Is it, uh, are we in need of Allah or Allah needs us? <laughs> you see what I mean? No, definitely we need Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Out of his mercy, he's giving us everything. Out of barakah, he's giving us all these things. You see what I mean? The same thing. We need to change the epistemic question. Why we have to do these things? However it is hajj, however it is a prayer, however it is fasting, why we are doing these things? What, what do they mean? And believe me, over the last 50 years, 
even philosophers, philosophers, in, uh, in particular in this country, they realize that they have to change the epistemic question. In the past, they used to ask themselves about knowledge. How do we know what we know? Okay, how, how you can bring the evidence that this is really a true knowledge, okay? But they, they, they reached like a, they hit the wall. So they had to change direction. So they felt that by changing the question, they can get more answers. So you know what is the new, the new question? What do you mean? Or ask me differently. <laughs> what do you mean? What do you mean by this? You see, what do you mean that doing this operation is better than doing that type of operation? Okay, that was, I mean, practiced before. What does that even mean? Does it mean that it is more beneficial for the people? Does it mean that it's shifted really? We have better understanding, let us say, of the anatomy? Or does it fit a certain, I mean, we can ask yeah. all these questions, but at the bottom line, at the bottom of it, at the end of the day, after everything is, is, is said and done, what do you mean? Exactly. So, all right, we are going to Hajj. What does it really mean to, to stand in Arafah? What does it really mean to go to Mina? What does it mean to throw these pebbles? What does it really mean, Tawaf? What does it mean, Sa'i? And the terminology helps us a lot. The terminology itself helps us a lot. But unless we start to change the question, we are not going to change the behavior or the, how we can benefit from experiences like that. Jazakumullah khair.